yeah, could you break down for us a bit more this RLHF concept? So, you know, what is it? What's involved? What data are needed? Um, you know, why why did people try this at all in the first place? Sure. So, again, OpenAI were, were the pioneers here, um, and they they actually built towards <clears throat> ChatGPT in, in in several kind of impressive papers. So. Their, their kind of first foray in this direction was um, uh, learning to summarize. And what they were interested in was, we know that language models, um, especially generative models, uh, are good at you know generating summaries, but people often complain that these summaries um, aren't very good. So when, when you try to measure you know, how good is a summary, you have some kind of automatic metrics like the Rouge score, uh, which try to measure kind of the overlap of your of your summary with a kind of reference summary, um, but generally speaking, people had always kind of recognized summarization models weren't great. So what they did instead was they said, "Well, why don't we get the model to generate some summaries, and we show those summaries to humans, and then we'll get the humans to rate which of the summaries is best." And so the idea was that instead of trying to use some metric like Rouge, which always has some you know limitations. The thing we really care about is people reading <laughs> summaries. So let's just teach the model, um, <clears throat> pardon me, how to um, how to learn that. And so the the recipe is relatively simple on paper. Basically, you take your um, summarization model, you you generate some summaries, you show them to humans, they label them, and then you train a second model, which is basically a classifier. Um, so this is called a reward model. And this classifier is basically learning how to distinguish good and bad summaries. And then what you do is you take those two pieces and you do a third step, which is where the reinforcement learning comes in. And essentially what you're trying to do is you're trying to optimize the model to produce better summaries. And reinforcement learning essentially has a, has a loop where you can essentially uh, generate some summaries from the model. Your reward model will, will basically rank them and say, okay, that's a good summary, that's a bad summary. And that gives you essentially a signal to sort of update the weights of the model uh, in a direction that is more aligned with whatever the reward model is, is telling you. And if you do those kind of three steps, what they showed in their paper is that the resulting models um, basically were preferred much more by humans uh, for summaries than, you know, the, the baseline. And that's kind of like the, the recipe that most people today are, are trying to follow, um, but now at much larger scales and not just for one task for summarization, but also for you know multiple tasks. And uh, the modern version of that recipe is that instead of having just summarization data, you now try to collect a large amount of what's called instruction data. So th these are things like write me a recipe for an omelet, give me 10 things to do in Paris, all these kind of very creative tasks that we, we have as humans or, you know, how do I write uh, Python code for X? And you train a model that is able to follow those instructions, but this model will always have this kind of problem that it may, you know, produce outputs that are a bit, you know, problematic or it just veers off in the wrong direction. And so you do those, that again, that human preference step, the reinforcement learning step, and then if everything works, you, you should get something like, you know, <laughs> ChatGPT, but um, no one has quite succeeded yet. And I think that's where there's a, a bit of an arms race at the moment in the in the open source community to to see who is like first uh, doing that. Yeah, very cool. So I'll quickly try to summarize back to you what RLHF is, or kind of paraphrase it, and then let's dig right into that exciting arms race. Sure. So the idea with this reinforcement learning from human feedback at a high level is that humans providing so probably most of our listeners, and if you haven't, you have got to use ChatGPT. A study actually recently came out that something only like 15% of Americans have used ChatGPT. Oh, wow. uh, hopefully in the data science community, it's above 90%. And <laughs> if you're listening to this right now and you haven't used ChatGPT yet, you've got to, or, or maybe, it, so if you're using like the GPT-4 API, <laughs> but haven't used the ChatGPT infer, interface, I will forgive you. Um, but in the ChatGPT interface, you have the opportunity after every single um, output that you get from the model, you can give it a thumbs up or a thumbs down. And so that, um, that thumbs up or thumbs down can then be used as training data for this RLHF. Um, and and the, Lewis outlined the steps uh, as to how this happens in more detail, but the summary point is that it allows 
the model to have outputs that are more aligned with the kind of thing that you would like to see. So going way back to earlier in our conversation, this means that these state-of-the-art generative models like GPT-4 are more than just a sophisticated autocomplete because there's this additional layer, at least this one, maybe even more that we don't know about, uh, layer of sophistication that means that the outputs are more, just more like what you expect in, um, in a conversation maybe with another human or maybe not, not even with another human, but just the kind of output that you want when you provide the kind of input that you do. And because of the, uh, how popular ChatGPT is, there's a huge amount of this training data, presumably, that allows OpenAI to be building a moat around what they've done. And we have, however, seen a lot of open source groups. So there are lots of open source models that have come out in recent months that have built on things like the Llama architecture mm -hmm. um, that I talked about back in episode 670. And so doing things like taking that Llama architecture, which was like just a sophisticated autocomplete, and then using instruction fine tuning afterward, um, using open source versions of these kinds of thumbs up, thumbs down human data um, in order to fine tune Llama to be able to be more like GPT-4. So uh, some of these architectures are like Alpaca, Vicuña is one that mm -hmm. is really popular. Uh, and there are ones that also have complete <coughs> commercial use um, uh, terms. So things like GPT-4 all J um, is completely suitable for commercial use. But anyway, so these the main point is that um, with RLHF, um, yeah, we get way better models and it's really cool that there's folks out there trying to, with the relatively limited open source data, relative to probably what someone like OpenAI has, doing the best that we can to be approximating the way that GPT-4 performs. And that brings me to my next question, Lewis, which, which is that as we talked about, these are really exciting times. We have lots of people like you, like everyone at Hugging Face and thousands of other people around the world are racing to be building open source tools that are as good as GPT-4. Maybe it's even conceivable that, and this isn't actually something that I've thought out loud before, uh, so I'd love to hear your input on this. Maybe it's even conceivable that the next big breakthrough in these conversational agents or in generative AI or in machine learning in general will be open source as opposed to coming from a commercial entity like OpenAI. Yeah, I think that's, that's definitely possible. And we already see um, a wide variety of uh, sort of directions that the community has taken um, to tackle some of the engineering challenges. So um, for example, the, we talked briefly about LoRa, um, or this low rank adaptation methods. Um, this is kind of uh, the, the, the driving um, strand at the moment in all of these instruction fine tuning experiments that the community is doing. Um, because for example, if you want to try to fine tune Llama 65B, so 65 billion parameters, you're gonna need several hundred gigs of GPU uh, memory. And for the average person, right, that's kind of out of reach. And uh, just recently, um, uh, Tim Detmers and his, his collaborators, he's a really impressive PhD student uh, at Washington. They um, they wrote a paper called QLaura. So this was like quantized LoRa. Mm -hmm. And they showed that, you know, with a four bit quantization, you can run um, and even train, uh, you know, Llama 65B on, on a kind of, you know, consumer grade GPU. And, um, I think those kind of innovations uh, are things that you wouldn't see from a, a private company uh, because it would be your competitive advantage, right? Why would you share that, that knowledge with the community? And it, it just shows that when you've got a tough problem, which is like, how do you train large models with limited um, you know, resources, people get very creative. Um, the other thing that I, I think has been quite interesting is um, the evaluation of um, these models, uh, especially these chat models. Um, is kind of gradually growing in maturity. So uh, a lot of um, the early uh, evaluation was done 
using something called um, basically the, the Vicuña benchmark. So the idea here was um, let's get GPT-4 to write a bunch of questions. Um, for example, you know, how do I solve this coding puzzle? And then you give that question to the models that you're interested in rating. And then, you know, you get GPT-4 to act as a judge and then kind of compare which model is better than the other. And um, in the early days, this, this you know, showed, oh, uh, Vicuña is like 90% as good as ChatGPT, um, according to that benchmark. Um, but most people who then interacted with Vicuña versus ChatGPT can see a fairly big capability gap. I mean, you can see that Vicuña can't hold conversations over many turns effectively. ChatGPT can do things, for example, you just dump a stack trace into it and it will then debug it for you, like unprompted. And so the, these models were, were lacking in, in certain areas. And uh, the community has now kind of realized that a lot of these things are often um, evaluating the style. So um, basically GPT-4, as an example, as a judge, um, will often prefer <clears throat> outputs that are just very wordy because, you know, ChatGPT is always like a kind of wordy chatbot um, rather than if they're factually correct or not. And even humans fall for this. So um, th there's a very nice paper from Berkeley where they essentially saw, they showed that, you know, even human evaluators would get tricked by, by essentially ChatGPT. And uh, I think that's like a, a general challenge today in the community is like, how do we know if the models are, are actually uh, very good? And um, I, again, it's something that I, I, I suspect OpenAI has, has cracked uh, in, internally, but there are things that, of course, that's your competitive advantage, right? So, so the community is, is going to make the innovation there. Um, and yeah, I mean, we can talk about other things. Like I think one thing that's kind of been an open question is um, do you even need reinforcement learning um, in the first place? And, uh, you know, this is, we, we know we have this kind of existence proof from OpenAI, but uh, there are other kind of researchers who are sort of skeptical that you truly need reinforcement learning, which has its own finicky problems. And uh, it's kind of exciting to think that, you know, we already have a few candidate alternatives, uh, you know, on the archive, which, um, you know, may prove to be more efficient and also simpler uh, to achieve the same objective.